welcome to the talk today. Uh, today, David is going to be talking about From Cuffs to Ramification, a friendly introduction to Riemann surfaces. I'll pass on to David now. Okay, thank you, Daniel. So welcome to my talk. Um, this talk will be in four parts. In the first part, I will talk about a little bit about intuitions as to why we study Riemann surfaces. And then I'll give you the definition of it and some immediate results we can obtain from that. And in the third part, we'll introduce a theorem called riemann hurwitz theorem, which is a pretty nice, pretty nice theorem about ramification, which is kind of the generalization of the phenomena you see here. And in the last part, I will talk a little bit about complex stories and their relationship to cool stuff like elliptic curve and modular forms. Um, I will probably not have enough time for the last part, but if I if I don't, I will just leave it as an additional section after the one hour limit. Let's get started. Um, of course, I would like to talk about this phenomenon that's illustrated here. But before that, let's look at the Riemann surface. Uh, sorry, Riemann sphere once again. This is the motivation. Um, in your early years, you are told that the complex plane is not perfect, but if I add exactly one infinity point on it, I can make it a sphere. And this sphere has many nice properties. It turns out, as you might have seen, that I can make sense of many things in complex analysis at this infinity point. For example, I can make sense of um, what is mean by um, being holomorphic, so complex differentiable at that point. And I can make sense of it taking some values at that point. I can make sense of um, the usual classification of singularities at the infinity point. So these are all pretty nice. But have you ever been skeptical about this? Why does it, why does it have to work? Is there an intrinsic reason why we take this so-called compactification of the plane instead of something else? Is there an intrinsic reason why we do this? And is there an alternative extended complex plane that I could take that might, that might do the same trick or maybe give me something even more? Because if you take a close look at it, in some sense, some geometrical object doesn't behave very well on the room sphere. For example, if what I care about is the geometry of lines on the complex plane, then the room sphere is not very good. Because for a pair of lines on the a pair of lines on the complex plane, if I look at them on the room sphere, they might intersect as two points, say this point and the infinity. Or if they are parallel, the intersect as one point. And that is a loss of symmetry. And obviously you don't want that. And another thing is, it thing is on the Riemann sphere, every line on the plane intersect as infinity. That makes infinity a special point, right? And we don't want that either. So in terms of the geometry of lines, um, C infinity is not a very good compensation, it turns out. But what should we have taken if we care about lines? Well, there is this thing called a projective plane. What I do is that I basically take the plane and add a bunch of infinity points to it. And how do I add this infinity point? For every family of parallel lines, I assign one point at infinity for them to intersect at. So that gives me a family of infinity points parameterized by possible slopes that are taken by the lines, parameterized by S1. So maybe it just see destroying union S1. And you can give it a topology. And turns out it's homomorphic to something like disk and that identify the side as like this. And in terms of the strong of lines, this is actually better because every pair of lines intersect as a unique point. Well, every pair of distinct lines intersect as a unique point. And for circles, you can say similar thing. Um, every circle and, well, let's not go into that. <laughs> but 
yeah, it behaves pretty well with respect to lines. So here's a question. Why did we take human sphere instead of the projective plane? Other than the obvious reason that it takes me a while to define it, but why don't we take the projective plane as our expanded complex plane? Because if I can both capture the um, notion of complex differentiability and the geometry of lines, would that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? So that's a question. Um, there are answers to this question, which I'm about to give later in the talk. But a short answer, well, a short non-answer would be the geometry of lines is not quite compatible with being complex differentiable. What do I mean by that? If you write down the equation of a line, which I almost, which I think I've forgotten, but I'm pretty sure if you write down an equation of the form f of z equals to zero, that defines a line, then f must involve conjugation. That is, f cannot be complex differentiable. And you can prove that. If you've taken complex analysis, you can prove this very easily by Lewis theorem. So, but this is not an answer. This is a non-answer because what I said was, well, if I take the intuition that I want the geometry of lines, that gets real projective plane. But if the geometry of lines is not the geometry I want, that doesn't that doesn't disqualify the real projective plane to be a possible model for my extended complex plane. So we need some more to answer that question. And turns out, um my story is just, yeah, but turns out it is impossible, actually impossible to make sense of complex differentiability on the projective plane as contrast to the hemisphere, but we'll get to that later. And the second intuition, well, before I get to that, let's just recall some um, terminology from um, complex analysis. I say a function f, from um, an open set uh, in C is analytic or holomorphic if it's complex differentiable. It is a conformal equivalence. So I'll shorten this as C if it has an inverse, which is also analytic. So one of the nice things about analytic functions is that locally they have a convergent tail expansion. That's that's where the word analytic comes from. And this is not true at all in the case of the real numbers because you get stuff like the pump function, which is pi over zero here, and um, here I think it's like e to the power negative or something. Um, but in a complex case, you can expand a, a well-defined um, complex differentiable function about any points, and it would converge locally. So there are a few consequences to that, because if you write down a series expansion, say f of z, well, I will just expand it around zero, but the general case would just be similar. You say a naught plus a1z plus a2z squared plus. Mm, if I ignore the constant term, then there is going to be a smallest n in which a n is non zero. Otherwise, f is just constant, which is not very interesting. So I can write, in this case, I can write f of z minus f of zero as z to the power n times g of z, where n is at least one, and g of zero is not zero. These are just standard complex analysis stuff. So there, there are a few consequences of this. One of them is called principal isolated zero, because if f of zero is zero, then this term is not gonna vanish around an open neighborhood of zero. And this, by continuity, is also not going to vanish in a small enough neighborhood of zero. So every zero of f has to be isolated. And 
Well, this is fine, but there is another more important consequences, consequence or uh, and more geometric consequence to this theorem, which is this. So suppose I have a complex differentiable function, then, well, and I pick a point and in the domain of that. So um, I said A here, but I, I, I'll just assume A equals zero. Um, then, um, close enough to zero, I can find a conformal equivalence, such that if I pre-compose F with this conformal equivalence, then I get the power map. Now this, by the look of it, this is quite magic. It is easy to prove, so we might as well just prove it first. Um, as usual, we can, well, by pre-composing F with some shifting stuff, um, we can write F of Z equal to the power n G of Z, where G of zero is not zero because we can pre-compose it. And obviously the thing we want to do next is to take the nth root from both sides. We don't quite, we can't quite just immediately justify it because as we all know, square roots or in general taking roots are not quite well defined over the complex plane because they are multi-value functions. But g of zero is non-zero. So if g of zero is here, then I take, can take a branch cut of law say here, and I will have a complex differentiable um, root function all over this domain with this branch cut removed. So at least close enough to zero, I can write g of z equals to h of z to the power n, where h is defined on the neighborhood of zero and is analytic. So, we essentially have this. But then we're done. Because what's the derivative of this thing over here? Um, at, at zero, it will just be h of zero. It's derivative at zero. But h of zero is not zero because g of zero is not zero. So the function z minus up to h of z has an inverse. So it's, well, it's locally a conformal equivalence. So that's what's given. So if I write this as, um, if I write this as phi inverse set, then F composed with phi applies to set, it's just z to power n. So th this is not hard, but it carries very important geometric intuition because if you look, if you look at what we're doing here, um, what phi does is that it gives, it perturbs the complex plane. Well, it's not perturbs, but it passes that small part of the complex plane to something else, which also looks like a complex plane, but F on that different complex plane would just be the power function. And one of the nice things about conformal equivalences is that they preserve angles. So, an immediate consequence of that is that if I, an immediate consequence of that is that if I only care about the local behavior of F in terms of the angles, then its behavior is determined by the same behavior but over a power function. So this n is, well, this n is known as the local degree. And it kind of answered the question that we, uh, I put in my abstract and also on this title page. You see, I originally, I have a smooth curve. And after I pass, after I pass it through an analytic function, which is supposed to be smooth and nice, I got a cusp. And the reason I got this cusp is that Locally, near this point, near this point zero, cosine behaves just like that square. Well, in terms like geometrically, so it doubles the angle as it it doubles any 
it doubles the angle at this point. So it, because this makes a 90 degrees, so this has to be 180 degrees. So this cusp has to occur. And it also answers the question, how can we classify such behavior? Because locally, since every function is just a power function, such behavior is classified by similar behavior by power functions, which we know a lot about. So this motivates a very important idea. If I can perturb my complex plane to make my function nicer, I might as well construct my complex plane in a different way, or maybe construct something else. Um, the gist of this is just that if I, if I don't consider a complex plane, but instead I consider something that just looks like a complex plane, but has a slight difference. Maybe I've passed it through a conformal equivalence, maybe something else. But if I consider that, then I can make functions nicer. So I can analyze holomorphic functions even easier. So that brings us to the actual definition of Riemann surfaces. So recall that what we want to do is that to have some objects and locally, we want each point of that object looks like just like C, so that we can do complex analysis over it. So a, an obvious way to do this is to pick some, some fragments of the complex chain and glue them together. And obviously, we don't, we don't want the gluing to be terrible, because we want the functions that are analytic on this part of the complex plane, this part of the, this object, this topological space, to be also complex differentiable here. So, so if this part is taken from here and this is taken from here, then if I walk from, walk from this, this is called a chart, walk from this chart to this chart, um, it defines a function between this part and this part. And obviously, we want that function to be a conforming equivalence. So this is a definition of Riemann surface. But um, really, there's not quite much to it. I, I will give this just later. Don't be bothered too much about this. I just have one more point to make other than the gluing part. Um, if I have already have a chart, you phi, well, did I? OK, let's do um, phi u then obviously if v is an open subset of u then phi v should also be a chart right but obviously we don't need that for it to cover the whole topology space but we want that to be a chart furthermore if if psi is another conformal equivalence then if i compose them i would also expect this to be a chart because it is compatible with any other chart if the transition function, which is the function, which is the gluing function I mentioned, uh, I mentioned here, yeah, this is called the transition function. So if the transition function between you and any other existing chart on the atlas um, is already conform a conform equivalence, then this should also be. So sometimes it's more useful if we talk about maximal atlas, maximal collection of charts that covers covers my topological space and also has also have um, conforming equivalence as the transition functions. So in that framework, it is easy to define what it means by a function between two well topological spaces e equipped with a maximal atlas. Um, well, subject to some some other conditions conditions like this. It's called a Riemann surface, and a map between two Riemann surfaces is complex differentiable. We can make sense of it by just saying it is complex differentiable if I regarded it as a function between the two patches that are glued together. So my yeah, so this is a gist. Um, if you want to specify a Riemann surface. Specifying the atlas might not be the easiest way to do that. Instead, what you want to do is that 
you tell me which continuous functions are differentiable. And in fact, that specifies the Riemann surface um, completely up to, up to isomorphism, which is, which is what you think this is. So let's take a look at some examples. First example is, of course, the Riemann sphere. Um, how do we get a chart, get an atlas on it? Well, um, you might have seen this, but if we want to talk about whether a function f is holomorphic, meromorphic, having some value, et cetera, at infinity, we say f of that is something at infinity, if and only if f of one of that is something at zero. I believe this is mentioned in complex method and complex analysis and maybe maybe other contexts as well. So this gives me a natural way to do that. I can take my two chart to be one of them um, to be just say excluding infinity. And another is C infinity and I take away zero. And in this case, um, the chart on this is obvious. I just take phi to be identity. So you can see just phi to be um, identity. And here, because of this correspondence, why not just take um, the chart to be, sorry, to be psi of z equals to one of the z. In that case, the transition, fun transition function, which is defined as long as z is not zero or infinity, is just one of z, which is a conformal equivalence there. So the Riemann sphere is indeed a Riemann surface. So that's a sanity check. And there are more interesting Riemann surfaces. For example, the torus can be made a Riemann surface as well. And how do we do this? Well, we do the exact same thing when we construct a real torus. We take R2 and we cushion it by the action of Z2 on it. So in other words, I, I consider this integer lattice on R2. And I, um, I say all, all these are the same thing. So I glue these two sides together and I glue these two sides together. And how, and how the chart defined, what we can do is just, well, in the middle, it's quite obvious. I just take it to be identity. And here, I can shift it to um, two parts of the unit circle. And like that, you know the drill. And in that case, if you will recall, um, the transition function is simply translations on R2, which happens to be conforming equivalences because they are linear. So that indeed gives me a Riemann surface. Um, there are other ways to construct Riemann surfaces. So we've seen the way which we just specify charts. We've seen the way I obtain through a quotient. And we can also construct Riemann surfaces by solving equations. But um, we will cover that, cover that later in the last session. But here, what I want to do is that I want to make the following claim. Um, in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned this uh, weird space called real projective plane. I claim that this cannot be made as a remiss of this. No matter how hard you try to find a chart, you, you just cannot find an atlas of charts, a collection of charts, such that they are compatible and covers the entirety of projective plane. And why do you think this is true? Um, I would like the audience to take a guess of how this works. Well, there's not much thing we know about real projective plane yet, but what do you think went wrong? I'll make 
a even stronger claim. Proposition. Every Riemann surface has to be orientable. Now this is something that's again is different from the case of the real, because well, the Klein bottle, the real protective plane, they are all real smooth surfaces. But neither of them can also be a Riemann surface. And what is true? Uh, it's actually pretty obvious because if you oh somebody's saying something in the chat. Uh, yeah, the chat was saying that the transfer map is gonna involve conjugation. Yeah, it could it's close to what we're getting to. Because um yeah, uh, I'll just continue with the proposition. Every real surface has to be orientable. Why is this true? Um, recall that in geometry we define orientability by something about the derivative of the transition function. And we want the transition function to be orientation preserving. So if that is a transition function, then saying it is orientation preserving is just saying the determinant of df is positive. Well, it can't be zero, but it's positive. But what if f is a conformal equivalence? What if f is complex differentiable? Then in that case, say if my complex function is this, if I return it in the real way, then if f is this thing, then df is, which is ux, uy, vx, vy, it's just by cauchy riemann equation, ux, uy, um, negative ui, ux. And it's determined as ux squared plus uy squared. So, which is, well, it's not negative, but it can't be zero because, um, because uh, it has to be a different system as well. So the, the cauchy riemann equation, the cauchy riemann condition imposed on complex differentiable functions essentially tells me that these transition functions are indeed all orientation preserving. So every Riemann surface are orientable. So in particular, since the real projective plane, as we all know, is not orientation, it's not orientable, it cannot be made a Riemann surface. And that's, well, partially answers the reason why we, well, that completely answers the reason why we don't take the real projective plane as an alternative extended complex plane. Okay, is there any questions up to this point? Let's proceed. Um, recall that previously I've said on the complex plane, if for any function f and near any point, I can precompose it with something to get a power map. <clears throat> and from the discussion of Riemann surfaces previously, you should know that this is simply saying that on our, on our chart, on the maximal atlas I impose on the complex plane, this is a power map. So in that case, I'm, refer I'm referring to complex plane as a Riemann surface. So it shouldn't shock you if I were to say the a similar thing is true for Riemann surfaces, because well, well, it's just the same thing. <laughs> and yeah, the theorem theorem is stated like this. Well, so for any function f from one Riemann surface to the other. Um, near a point in the domain, in the co-domain, I can find a chart such that um, the f here becomes, well, on the chart I have to conjugate it by the respective homomorphisms. So f just becomes this thing. And here, this is just a power map. And of course, as usual, there are some geometries behind this. Well, um, I should first mention that this n does not depend on the specific choice of charts. And there are many reasons for this. Um, 
you can just prove it. Or alternatively, you can say, well, what does a power map do? As I say, it behaves just looks like a power map because it behaves like a power map after I conjugate it by some homo homeomorphism. But homeomorphisms are also bijections. So if I look at the pre-images of each point, this should behave, F should behave exactly the same way um, to that map to the, that to the power n. So essentially, if if um, this p this is f of p, and I have some n here, and essentially what this does is just like what a power map does. It maps this is one to one, but for n for any point near it, it becomes an n to one map. So this also explains why, uh, in this case, n equals three. In this also explains why um, n has to be unique. Well, depends only on the point you're cho you're choosing. And, uh, so this n is called the ramification index. It measures how bad F is. So if you if if you think about the case that I introduced at the you know abstract in, in the cover, it's it's basically saying how how does a how does a curve through that point, that point P to be bandit, how bad is this singularity? So there are some more terminology. Um, so if this is P, and this is alpha P, and the image of a ramification point is called a bunch point. And if this reminds you of something about the branching of certain multi-value functions, it is exactly that um, in certain cases. It is not exactly the same um, if you are saying the branching of logarithm, but it's exactly the same for the branching of functions such like um, square root z cube minus z. So as I say, yeah, um, if I've chosen my chosen my chart wisely, then for points near near f of p, they have exactly n many pre images. But at here it has exactly one pre image. So how so how how often does F ramify? Um, I kind of already answered this question myself because as I say, as I say, um, oh, I'm not going to draw the same diagram again. But oh, um, some people. Uh, the yeah, other is asking whether or not n is a property of the point P. Yes, it's a property that depends on the point P and the function f. So yeah, if f ramifies at this point P, if f turns out to be to be um, z to the power five at this point P, then near it it cannot ramify, right? Because if because if it can, if it ramifies again at this point, then if I look at the pre-images near it, then everything just has five pre-image. Every, yeah, everything just has five pre-image. And, oh, sorry, everything just has one pre-image because, because the, yeah, the, the dimension and stuff like that. So if F ramifies at one point, then it cannot, it cannot ramify again near that point. Um, there's another view to take on this. If I consider f as a function from the complex plane to the complex plane, or a subset of complex, or a subset of complex plane to the complex plane, then f ramifies at that point. It's just saying that f of z equals to. It's a, it's just saying that the series expansion of f starts at well starts at some n that is greater than one. So this is just saying that f prime of zero is zero. So by principle of isolated zeros, which I mentioned earlier, 
this cannot happen on this cannot happen like on a accumulated set of points. It can either happen everywhere or happen nowhere. But this happening everywhere is just saying f is locally constant, which are excluded from our discussion. So this is how often. And there is another question about how many. Um, this question is similar to the one before, because if if our rumor surface is not compact, then this, this question is hard to ask and hard to answer, because there can be infinitely many ramification points for a function on a non-compact rumor surface. For example, just take the function f of z equal to cosine of z. Then f prime of z, which is sine of z, vanishes everywhere at um, pi z. And it's an inf infinite family of ramification points. So in the case of non compact rumor surfaces, we can't actually say much. But what if it is compact? If it is compact, then there's a usual trick in topology, which is, which is just, as, as we already know, if f ramifies at one point, it cannot ramify at an open set near that point. So why don't we just cover, cover my remote surface with charts like this, with open set like this? So I can, I can make a choice of this open set, such that each open set either contains one ramification point or none at all. And after subtracting, after like, um, after obtaining a finite subcover of this covering, I can then conclude that there's only finitely many ramification points on any given compact rumen surface. Is that clear? So naturally, if you have some some finite um, number of values you will want to sum it up. And this is a theorem called Willen's theorem. Um, it says that if I, if I have some point Q on my target remote surface, and I consider the pre-image of this, so there might be um, P1, P2, P3, P4, and they might ramify to different degrees. So, Let's say um, it ramifies at P1 to, it, maybe it doesn't ramify at P1, it might be 1, and it might ramify to degree 3 at P2, and degrees, degree 3 at P4, sorry, okay, degree 7 at P3. Then what I can do is I, I can sum all this up. So if I add them up, it's 14. And I claim that this does not depend on Q in the case where, where all my remains of this are compact. Um, why is this true? So an easy trick to prove this is to observe that I can define it differently. Since we, since, since we know that if I perturb Q just a little bit, then say near P2, every point in my perturbation is gonna have three p-images. So what I can do instead is that I can say, well, if I can find the neighborhood of Q, such that the pre-image of this neighborhood are, the, are contained in the charts where F are power maps, then I, can, then I can say D of Q is just equal to the number of pre-images of this perturbation uh, Q plus epsilon. Well, um, it's not the denotation, but it's just at this perturbation. And from here, it's quite obvious how you prove this, because if I can define this this, this way, then I can say, well, um, for, for a non branch point, this is certainly, for, for a non branch point, this is certainly constant, because, yeah because it's constant. Um, for branch points, I can find power neighborhoods. And this argument just shows 
that is also equal to a perturbation, which is equal to the respective value for perturbation, which is already fixed. So this this value d is called the degree of f. So a little thing is to check. Um, if f is a polynomial, say um, f of z equals to uh, well, I consider this on the Riemann sphere, and the x to z to power well, then minus one to power two, then minus two to power three, then minus three to power four, then as you can verify, um, the degree of this is nine. Degree of this is nine, and in general, in general, a polynomial of degree n also has well, a polynomial of degree n also has degree n. But yeah, you know what I mean. So I finally get it here, which is a theorem called the Riemann Hurwitz theorem. It basically says um, I can relate some values that I obtain from a from an analytic map between two compact Riemann subsets by the Euler characteristic of them. And the first part of this is easy to understand. It just if a degree if if the degree of f is n, then well naturally R should be like R should be like at n times wrap around S. And then and this should make the all characteristic of R approximately n times the all characteristic of S. Except I need to account for this bad point where the geometry is messed up, where the number of pre-images is messed up. But this is not too messed up in the sense that I can still quantify it by summing up um, the ramification point minus one. And this is a finite sum because most points only ramification only ramify to index one. So surprisingly, this is quite easy to prove. As I mean, the uh, I mean the analog of this in algebraic geometry is quite hard to prove. But in the case where we have topological tools, this is actually quite easy. So recall that the other characteristic of a surface R is V plus F minus E, where V is the number of vertices, F is the number of faces, and E is the number of edges in any triangulation of a surface. Then, um, so if I write um, this VR, FR, ER. I don't want to work with it just yet because I want to get a nice triangulation. Because um, my ramification point, my ramification behavior can happen anywhere and it might not be quite compatible with my triangulation. So what I want to do is that I want every ramification point to land on a vertex. And I can do that because say I already have a I already have a triangulation. Then if the ramification point if the ramification point is on a vertex, then I'm done. If it's on an edge, sorry, not quite. If it's on an edge, say here, then I can link up here to make to make it a vertex. Um, if it's in the middle of a triangle, then I can do something like this. Anyhow, there's a way I can make ramification all happen at vertex, vertices. And I want some something more. I want I want this triangulation to be fine enough such that every triangle is contained. Every triangle is contained in a power neighborhood. So a neighborhood where f reduces to a power function. If I've set it, test this up, then it's pretty off and it's pretty easy to prove the theorem because what is FR? Well, um, 
the faces, since I've put all the ramification behavior on the vertices, there should be no ramification at the surface. So the number of pre-images of um, this, this open face is just n, which is the degree of f. So f of r equals n times f of s. Similarly, e of r is n times e of s. Again, because there's no ramification whatsoever at this point. So of course, after I've put all the bad behavior to vertices, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna pay it back. Um, v of r is not quite n times v of n times v of s. It is if I don't have any ramification point, but I have some. But if that happens, if that happens, what should I do? So I need to discount something. If that happens, say, uh, say, I'm using the same example where this is, this is on vertex Q, and these are the respective ramification points, and they might ramify to, to um, degree one, three, three, seven. Um, then, say, I'm looking at this, this chart. If there is like three vertices, sorry, three edges through this point Q, then here it should be nine edges here because it's from five. Uh, yeah, yeah, because because uh, as we discussed earlier, every point out here need to have three pre images here. So it's just so in a way, it is saying that I'm getting six more six more edges. Or in other words, I'm getting um, I'm I'm I should have gotten three vertices here. I only got one. So I should discount a factor of three minus one. Is that is that does that make sense? So similar for all these points, because there's no nothing special about three. So the discount factor here is naturally I just summing up all the ramification index by subtraction by one. And if I put them together, it gives me the theorem. So this is particularly easy proof for such a great theorem because and normally you see a film like this, it links to some global topology and some function defined on it. it. It's normally pretty hard to prove, but in this case, it's pretty easy. And there are very important consequences to this. Uh, I'll just, uh, no, just copy down this again here. Uh, okay, power, just square of f. Minus something else. I I I don't usually care about something else because the replication index might might get slightly involved to calculate, but um, this is a very powerful theorem, and I don't quite have time to show you exactly how powerful it is. But what I'm gonna do is an example. So what if R is the remiss sphere? Then chi of r is two. Then if if I if if f is a function from the Riemann sphere to another unknown compact Riemann surface, it's compact Riemann surface S. Then what I get is two equals degree f times chi of s minus something irrelevant, but this something irrelevant is non-negative. So inevitably, chi of s has to be positive. But this just means that s is actually C infinity. Because there is no other surface that has outer characteristic two or, or has positive outer characteristic. So indeed, the only analytic function from the room sphere to anything, actually anything, because 
well, I, I'll explain that later. But to anything, it's just to itself. And as I say, to anything, it's because um, this thing here is compact. So there's an analog of open mapping theorem in, in the surface that says that analytic maps are, in particular, an open map. So the image of F has to be open because it's an open map. And it has to be closed because um, C, C infinity is compact. So it has compact image, but my remote surface is host off, so it's closed. So it's both open and closed, but remote surfaces also have to be connected. That's why um, it has to be, that's why F has to be surjective. And furthermore, F has to be, um, uh, and furthermore, my target surface has to be compact as well. And this applies to all compact surfaces, not just C infinity. So essentially, we actually know all the analytic maps on C infinity to whatever thing. It is either constant or it is a rational map from C infinity to itself. Um, yeah, right on time, an hour. Yeah, I have an expository section about complex tori um, at the end. I'm not sure how. Um, I'll first take some questions, and if if there are people left here, I will continue with that section. Is there any questions, or maybe general questions about the surface geometry? Okay, I'll continue to the last section. The last section isn't really about the surface. Well, it stems from the surface, but I want to underline some linkage between the theory of the surfaces and some other theories like elliptic curves, like modular forms. So you should know that complex tori are very special. Um, there are a few reasons for it. One of the reasons is that um, its aural characteristic is zero. So if you put that in Riemann Hurwitz theorem, it basically says that the degree of f doesn't, doesn't matter if I want to use Riemann Hurwitz theorem, and this is a big deal. And another reason why complex, tor complex tori are quite special is that I can obtain it using a quite natural way. Um, this is a proposition. If gamma, which is a subgroup, um, well, on the addition of C, such that gamma is dis discrete, in a sense that there exists some positive R um, with four X in gamma. Um, then gamma is either the trivial group or generated by one element or generated by two elements. I'm not going to prove this because it's not hard to prove. And yeah, you, you can try this yourself. And the consequence of this is that I can look at the quotient of C by gamma. In the first case, I get C. In the second case, I get something that's um, analytically equivalent to C, but minus one point, I think. Yeah. Um, but in this case, well, this thing is just a lattice. So this is a torus. So a torus arises naturally in these situations. It can also arise not quite naturally from elliptic curves, which as you may recall is equations of from y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. Now, I don't know about you, but the, but the first time I saw an equation like this, it seems unnatural. It seems like it's just made up out of nowhere. But, well, turns out if I solve this equation in C squared, and I add it, and I union it with some points at infinity,
Then what I get is out of torus. It turns out um, these two constructions of, of, tor of complex tori are equivalent. Well, first of all, there is more than one complex tori up to isomorphism, but these two constructions of complex tori are equivalent. Uh, one, there's a way that you can, there's a way that you can produce an explicit correspondence. So in other words, the theory of elliptic, elliptic curves over C um, arise naturally by viewing it as a particular case of the torus. So this, so this is one part of the story. Another part of the story is that since I have many, many different incompatible complex torus exist, then naturally I want to parametrize them for, well, in other words, it's called a modular space of these different torus. Um, but how do I parameterize this? I, I constructed it uh, previously using subgroups by saying it's um, z equals to z tau 1 plus z tau 2. Um, it shouldn't shock you if I say this is equivalent to is this is equivalent to um, c quotient z plus z tau 2 over tau 1. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna write, write them as like tau one tau two or one tau two over tau one just for easy notation. So since I have this equivalence, I can supposedly parameterize them by um, values on upper half plane. So I can write every torus in the form c quotient one tau, where tau is in the upper half plane. But this is not the end of the story because, because this is not like a faithful parameterization. Um, there are cases where if I generate it by one tau, it, it, it turns out to be conformally equivalent to the same thing, but generated by one sigma. But turns out <laughs> this is equivalent in saying that tau equals to a sigma plus b over C sigma plus D, where A, B, C, D is an element of SL2, Z. So the integers suddenly pops out of, out of nowhere. And this also tells me that um, I can parameterize every, every complex torus in D by viewing them as the um, Orbit of the action of SO2 that H, which is up above half plane. So it shouldn't shock you if I were to say there are something special about holomorphic functions on the upper half plane, such that it is symmetric with respect to this action. And it cannot be too symmetric because of Lewis theorem. I cannot let it, uh, most of the case I cannot let it like invariant on the section because that was just make it constant. So the solution would be, I say uh, F A tau plus B over C tau plus D. Well, I don't want it to equal to F tau. I want a factor here such that I can obtain a non-zero dimensional um, space of functions, but not too, but I don't, I also, I also don't want the dimension to be too big because if, if it's an infinite dimensional space of functions, I don't know how to analyze it. So it turns out what works is, well, there are other reasons to do this, but it turns out what works is one over C tau plus D to power K, where K is a positive integer. So functions like this, uh, known as modular forms. So um, yeah, this is again a, an object where if you just Google its definition, it's really hard to see where it comes from. But from from this from this from, from this procedure, if I if I just want to parameterize um, the complex torus, then I arrive very naturally to functions of this form. 
Um, yeah, there's an analog to it. Um, apparently, the, the guy who um, realized that such function can be interesting, well, at the time it's like automorphism forms, was um, Poincaré, and he thought they don't exist. And like after 15 days of void effort trying to prove that they don't exist, they just, he just come up with an example. Then, yeah, this is how my research works. So, so we start from complex theory, and we naturally arrive to arrive at two different objects. One of them are ellipt elliptic curves, and another are modular forms. Um, um, so it shouldn't shock you if I were to say there are some connections between these two theories. Um, indeed, they are. Um, not about elliptic curves over C, though, but it's about elliptic curves over Q. So it turns out the for for any elliptic curve like this over the rationals, you can define what's known as a Hasse-Weil theta function. And turns out for every modular form, you can also define a theta function. And, and it's a result known as um, Hasseville conjecture. We're saying every zeta function ob obtained from here also pop up, pops up in here. So this is a special case of what's known as the modularity theorem, which as you might recall, assisted in the proof of from Atlas theorem. I'll stop here. Any questions? I guess if there are no questions, uh, thanks to David for giving this very nice talk today. There'll be more talks next week and there'll be more information sent out about those soon.